television highlights of the news of yesteryear. of America's Sweetheart. It's 1919, and Mary Pickford signs contract forming United Artists Corporation. D.W. Griffith makes it official, too. And then, outside United Artists' offices, from left to right, Mary poses with Douglas Fairbanks, Griffith, and Charlie Chaplin. Here's Mary suffering in silent film Rosita. Got you in me power, me proud beauty, says villain. But hark, here's our hero come to save his damsel in distress. It's scenes such as this that are Hollywood's finest film fair in 1923. In nick of time and final reel, America's sweetheart is again saved by her celluloid bowl. Actress and aviation share this famous first. In 1919, Miss Pickford delivers victory loan propaganda film addressed to Woodrow Wilson, White House, Washington. Hollywood's First Lady sets precedent as package for first citizen of land is loaded and lofted into air on first plane to carry motion picture film. It's aviation history in the making. All done though, Mary faces camera and goes back to making pictures. But not without giving free time to worthy causes. Here in 1919, she passes out Pickford edition of paper in Los Angeles Salvation Army Drive. America's sweetheart has America's biggest heart. And one of America's biggest thrills is 1920 marriage of Mary Pickford to equally famous Douglas Fairbanks. They're home from honeymoon here. Now America's sweetheart and Hollywood's most dashing hero are just Mary and Doug, world's most wonderful man and wife. Their home is Pickfair, one of most lavish of movieland mansions. Here, the king and queen of Hollywood live in royal splendor. These are indeed halcyon days and happy years. Pickfair's a paradise, but no Hollywood hideaway. It's home to Mary and Doug, but it's also scene of much revelry. In 1922, at Pickfair, Mary's brother Jack married Marilyn Miller. Here, Mary and Doug join bride and groom. Kisses for each, from Mary with love. Same year, on set of Robin Hood, Miss Pickford and husband show Legion Commander Alvin Owsley around gigantic lot. Everything they do on the screen is box office, and everything off is news. On set of The Thief of Baghdad in 1924, spectacular eclipse of the sun doesn't dim brilliance of these two brightest stars of Hollywood heaven. When not working, Mary finds time for fun, too. Here on Arbor Day, 1927, she puts everything she has into planting. Tyke from Toronto is only fair with a pig. Job gets done, though, and Mary's done another good deed. Years later, Mary joins Doug in four months round the world tour. Aboard liner Olympia, they're off on holiday that takes them to Alexandria, Egypt. Here they disembark for train trip to Cairo and few lazy days in land of the Nile. Note Mary's dress. You'll see it soon again. Under Fez, Doug has little fun with his famous face, but has more fun coming home again. Oops! Athlete Fairbanks slips on steps. But there's no hitch in way Doug hops into this scene with Mary. For 1930 visit from ex-president Calvin Coolidge and wife, Mary sports same costume she wore a year ago in Cairo. Doug must be inviting Coolidge to fast game of tennis till producer Louis B. Mayer joins the distinguished party. This was all many years and many films ago. And this is Miss Pickford as she was then, 
and still is now in America's memory. Born Gladys Smith, she'll live forever as America's sweetheart, Mary Pickford. Fire and flight, February 10th, 1930. Behind that smoke, flames are gutting interior of Chicago's Gunther Building. Firemen battle blaze and fight to reach upper floors where office workers are trapped. Half the seven story is finally cleared and some workers freed, but wait a top floor is blocked. Stairways and sea of flames, only escape seems by windows eight stories above street. Firemen try vainly to subdue flaming structure, but fire rages on and people on upper floor are out of reach. Looking ladders are not long enough, so safety nets are ready. And here's woman making eight-floor flight and escape from fiery death. She's safe and soon fires out. Famed for her romances and jewels, Peggy Hopkins Joyce comes home from Paris on good ship Mauritania. At 25, Peggy has already won fame and three millionaires. Here's Academy Award winner Wallace Berry. Famed for role in The Champ in 1931, Berry was no chump co-starring with Marie Dressler in Men and Bill. Here in early 1930, he's living real life drama as he's made Lieutenant Commander in Naval Reserve. It's well-deserved honor for Wallace Berry. With singing teacher P.M. Marifiotti, here's Miss Grace Moore in 1928. Only 27 years old, Grace has already found fame and fortune. When these films were made, there were still more things in store for Grace. Her destination, a brilliant career in motion pictures, and then, tragic death. Four million dollar ditch. It's March 1925, and at 6th Avenue and 42nd Street, New York City, they're digging extension of Queensboro subway line. Big Ditch is designed to deal with traffic of travelers jamming Grand Central Underground Terminal just a few blocks away. Solid Rock of Manhattan Isle demands drilling, and worker warns sidewalk superintendents to stand back because they're blasting away. Dangerous work in heart of city damaging to parks and monuments, too. At cost of $4 million, ditch is dug as skyscrapers tower over Manhattan's newest underground. Fascinating footwork. It's Dancing Masters Convention in New York City, 1927, and Conclave gets its first look at ballroom contrivance called the Kinkajou. Let's have a look at it in slow motion. It's latest and greatest thing in dancing, Batty Seven. Just a few weeks before these films were made, Charles Lindbergh leaped the Atlantic. So here's dance invention called the Lindy Whirl. Inspired by nothing quite as definite, here's premiere performance of the Yankee Prance. But even in show of what's new in dancing, there has to be an old-fashioned walk. Winning World War I. In France, at height of hostilities in First World War, French ground crews haul strange equipment out of hiding. It turns out to be tanks of gas and weirdly shaped balloons. Modeled after famed German Drachenkite, commonly called the sausage, this is Eli's answer to observation by air. Hauled to takeoff point, balloon is quickly prepared for ascent. From air, balloonists will spot enemy positions and guide fire of Allied artillery. Here's what it looks like from skybound basket underneath balloon. Craft is not free flying, though. It's anchored to armored car. 
Observer makes notes on what he sees. When he wants higher look, he gets lift from longer wire. Dangerous duty this. Balloons are sitting ducks for enemy aircraft. So soon as word of enemy maneuvers is phoned to fighting front, work of balloon is done and it's all over but the battle. In good old galoshing time, in Chicago in early 1920s, sloppy galoshes are in style. And in eyes of every man, the floppier the footwear, the broader the approving smile. When feet meet, you can hear the click of open clasp above this chatter. No doubt talk was about some old-fashioned girl with closed galoshes. Or it's button up your overcoat and open up your boots. for Hitchcock. At Alhambra, California, January 1929, Tommy Hitchcock leads his San Carlos gold makers against Anzacs of Australia in fast-moving international polo match. Drive by lads from down under gets ball near goal, but San Carlos boys in dark shirts fight back. High-riding Hitchcock hammers ball away from battling opponents, and here's a score for the Anzacs. But when it's over, it's Americans over Australians, 10 to 7. Start of Speedway Classic. It's Memorial Day 1937 and racing drivers thrill crowds watching breathlessly as cars roar around turn after turn in grueling 500 mile race. In lead is Wilbur Shaw and crowd goes wild as Shaw looks like he's going to win. He does and then wheels into winner's circle 1937 Speedway champ. He does it again in 39 and 40. Wilbur Shaw, three times a racing king. Thank <laughs> you.